I don't know about you, but uh, this eventually will, can, and it has in my heart, uh, become a second home, right? Just constantly coming up here and seeking the Lord and sharing with brothers and sisters. Again, we're so glad to have you here this morning. If you can uh, follow me to the book of Luke. And we're going to jump right into this. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. And I'm sure some of you have heard this story of Zacchaeus. Chapter 19, verse 1 says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. He is Jesus. Amen? This is narrating what Jesus was doing. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was, he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he, and he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of, my, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. <coughs> you want to bow your head with me. Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing us to worship you, to praise you. Now we ask that you speak to our hearts, that you speak to our life, Father. We know our condition. We know that we are, that we, uh, we are faulty, Father. That we, there are things in our life that we still need to surrender to you, God. And at the light of your word, Father, we ask that you continue to cleanse us and give us discernment as far as what we need to do, Father. We praise, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, quite an interesting story. You know, I don't know, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, there was an ice cream truck, right? There was an ice cream truck that always came around my house. Always, it was so, it was like 305 nonstop. It was, it was always there like clockwork. And I just remember, right? And as I was reading this, and it says that he, he it says uh, that this man named Zacchaeus, he heard that Jesus was walking by, right? He heard that Jesus had entered Jericho, and he wanted, this man wanted to really see who Jesus was, right? And it says that he hurried. If you, if you continue to read further down, it says, uh, let me see, verse 6, it says, and he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When I read that, I, for some reason, I, I kept thinking of myself, you know, age 9 or 10, just running. Uh, when I would hear that little, you know, that little chime, that little song in the ice cream truck. Um, just remember, me and my brother, we would run outside as soon as we'd hear that, you know, that the little chime. Funny enough, later, my parents ended up buying an ice cream truck, and, you know, we, we, had, we had the hookup, as they would say, right? Nonstop, just everyday ice cream. Anyways, but I don't know when was the last time you felt the need, you felt the pressure, you felt the anxiety, I want to call it, to really hurry up. Maybe you were, uh, I don't know, maybe over the holiday break, you were anticipating family members and you were really excited to see them, right? Maybe you hurried and saw them. But here in the Word of God, we see a man. We see a man who obviously was in need, right? And, and let's, let's read into it. It says, verse 19, verse 1, it talks about our Lord Jesus is entering into Jericho. You know, as we know, our Lord Jesus was all in this area, and he would nonstop go from city to city, from community to community with his disciples sharing the gospel. But in this specific case, verse 2, and says, And there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So to put this into context, when Jerusalem was under control by the Roman uh, Empire, they would take these bright people who were Jewish, who they were from Israel, and they'd take them and they'd, they'd make them work for the Roman Empire 
to collect taxes from all the people of Israel, right? So to be a tax collector was something uh, not very pleasant back in these back in these times. They would look at you. The people from Israel would look at you as a traitor, right? Your own people would look at you uh, look at you as a traitor. Uh, the Romans they wouldn't even look at you as a good enough citizen to be considered Roman. So it was just a hard spot to be in. But we see that this man, he was trying to see who Jesus was, and and you know. I don't know if you know Jesus and if you if you've given him the opportunity to come into your life. But this man had heard this man had perhaps maybe seen, you know, a testimony of other people. And most of us come to church by what we hear. Right. Amen. I know that, you know, when I first started coming to church, it was I was in desperate need. Right. I had just married and I had been maybe I think I was married a year and a half. And tribulation started coming to my life, and I was like, whoa, this whole marriage thing is a lot harder than what I expected, right? And I just remember that the Lord used my marriage to make us come to him. So the very same way we see here, this man must have been going through something, right? And, and uh, he hears the testimony of perhaps people, and he, sees, he says, I want to know who this man is, right? So he, verse 3, says Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. And he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Who do you hang out with? I ask you really quick. Who do you hang out with? Who are your friends? Who are your acquaintances? Do they edify you? And these, you don't have to answer any of these questions. You know, just think about this. Just reflect on this. Because it says here that he wanted to see Jesus he wanted to know Jesus. See, it says he was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was unable because of the crowd. That's, that's many of our lives. Many of us know that, you know, God has been having so much <clears throat> detail to attention with our lives, and he, he provides, and he shelters, and he heals, and he's, he's doing all these things in our lives, and we kind of see him. We want to see him, Right? But there are things in our life that hinder us from seeing the Lord act in our lives. But we see here, one of those things is that crowd, right? And, and, and work with me as I, as I share this. I know that there are many people who come to church. And, and they do it to please God. They do it to come and, and, you know, maybe calm your conscience. But in reality, the Lord doesn't want that. The Lord wants you to really seek Him genuinely, right? And in the word it says, in truth and in spirit. But here we see that there are obstacles that are always going to get in between you and the Lord. I don't know what it might be, right? I, I know that uh, for a while there, I know that even, even me, once I started coming to church, there was friends here at church that later left, right? Because they just they didn't want to seek the Lord anymore. They fell into addictions. And these same group of people who had then become my friends right? They were keeping me away from church. So what, what prevents you from coming to church? Think about these things, right? But also we see here, verse 4, and I really like this visual. It says, so he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree in order to see him. You know, brother, sister, friend, you're going to have to go through obstacles. There, you're going to have to fight against the current against the tide, because the Word of God also says that nobody wants to please God. Nobody wants to seek God. In our own nature, we don't want to do that. We'd much rather be at home, right, with this weather, maybe sitting in your patio. I don't know what you want to do with this weather, right? Just, but sometimes you're like, maybe not at church, right? So the flesh, there's a constant fight between your flesh between what you want to do, between what your will is, and what God wants you to do. There's always going to be obstacles. But I like this visual. It says, he ran and he climbed into a sycamore tree. Listen to this. A sycamore tree, biblically, it actually means to be spiritually reborn. Okay, so it's not, you know, it could have just said, and Zacchaeus climbed the tree. But the Lord is trying to show us something. And, and it says here that he climb specifically a sycamore tree. 
So let's go to the book of uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Let's read this list. And, you know, some of these things, it's who we were. Maybe there's some of these things that maybe you still are. Maybe I am, right? It says, but now also you put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Another verse. Let me see if I can find it here. And we see it here, actually, it says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. And then verse 10, it says, And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Zacchaeus is not only climbing up a tree. Zacchaeus here, we see that he is hurrying up. He's desperate for help. He's trying to make a call. How many of you have ever been like that? I can tell you many a times. Many a times, and let me tell you something, you can call a friend, you can call your brother, you can call your sister, like in blood, right? You can call your mom, and somebody will always fail you. But the Lord doesn't fail. How many of us know that? The Lord will always be there, right? And, and that's one of the things that, that catches my attention here, because it says in verse, uh, let me see, verse, uh, I lost it here. It says, renewed in the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So there's true knowledge. There's, there, there are things out there that many of us don't know, right? If you follow me to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived. How many of us, does, I don't know, maybe you're checking off the list disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But listen to this. This is what Zacchaeus experienced, and this is what the Lord wants you to experience. It says, But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. If you're here, it's because of his mercy. If you're here listening to this message, it's because of his mercy. There is nothing else that can, uh, that can describe or define why, why it is that we, we're here. But we see here, and it says further down, it says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the, wash, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. How many, how many of you have experienced the Holy Spirit in your life? He's real, right? Many of us are like, ah, I want to, maybe, that, you know, we're, we're shy about that. But the Holy Spirit is real. He's real. And he will give you the discernment. And then there, I remember many a times where I can be standing in the grocery line, you know, in, in the grocery store in line, and, and the, word, the, the Lord just, you know, using the Holy Spirit in our life, he just gives you a word to the person next to you or maybe your co-workers going through something and you know they they you know how many of us know that co-workers are excited when they know that you're a christian i can tell you about me at work they were like you're a christian right and they try to play it off like it's whatever but to be honest when they're going through something who are they seeking the christian right something's happening and they're like hey you know i'm going through this right and they, they might be shy about it but it's the reality right i can tell you so many times my, one of my previous bosses in a, in a previous job that I had, he'd made fun of me. He'd all the time, he'd say, oh, yeah, here comes a Christian boy. Oh, yeah, where were you at? Prayer? You know, like all these things because he was, he, was, he, he was agnostic. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, man, this guy is, you know, we, we, we got along great. But he always made fun of me. And I just remember one time his daughter was really ill. And I remember I sent him a, biblical, a Bible verse. And then I remember he called me and, you know, he called me crying and he, he, he wanted to thank me for, for that verse because he said his family had been, you know, been there for support, but hadn't really spoken to him about, you know, God. And I just left it at that. But the next few days we were at work and he started to open up his heart to me. 
And he told me that he wanted, more to, he wanted to know more about God. And I saw this as an opportunity to really open up and talk, you know, talk about different issues. But how God, and I gave him my testimony, and I can tell you that God used the Holy Spirit at that time to really help you know, um, guide him through what he was going through. But we see here that these were, this is who you were. This is who I was. And I know that there at times we might, this might manifest, but you know, it says that we were foolish, right? We were disobedient. It says we were deceived. We were enslaved to various lusts. Who's your God? Think about that. Who is your God? And, I, and, and, and not a God like, like the real God, but who reigns over you? What lust, what pleasure reigns over you? What addiction reigns over you? Think about that. Because that's the reality of it. Many of us, there's a barrier between us and God. How many of us know that? And that barrier is called sin. And that's why we feel unrighteous. And that's why we feel like we can't get closer to God. Because the, our sinful condition creates a barrier between us and God. Because nothing unholy, nothing unrighteous can, can get near God. That's why the Lord, uh, that's why through Jesus Christ, we're able to come to our Lord before him. Because it uses Jesus Christ as a filter, if you will, to cleanse us, right? And not all of us. Let me tell you, look around. Look, look at these beautiful faces. Look around you. Give them a big, beautiful smile. Just look around. Come on, guys. Let me tell you something. That person you just smiled at, don't tell them. They got issues. That person you just smiled at, they have issues. But what? We're here. And, and we recognize that we have issues, right? There are areas in our life we have not yet surrendered fully, right? But that's why we're here, because we want to seek God. We want to please God. We want to be able to say, God, here I am. Whenever I'm going through adversity, I want to make sure that I can raise my hand and say, Lord, here I am through prayer. And say, I'm going through these things, Father. What, what can I do? And, and he's going to look at me. And in his grace and in his mercy, he's going to see righteousness if I've acted righteous. And according to that, he's going to be able to fulfill his will in my life. But there's a barrier. There's a barrier between you and, and God that doesn't allow us to get near him. And if you want to follow me back to, to the book of uh, Luke chapter 19... Verse 5 says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Wouldn't that be quite an experience? God calling you, our Lord Jesus calling you by name. Would that be exciting, right? Just think about it. A man you've never met in a society where you're a nobody. Well, maybe this guy was a tax collector, right? He was rich, it says there. But nonetheless, he was despised by both the Roman community and the Jewish community. We, we have a man that's stuck in between two worlds. And he's despised either way. And the Lord reaches out to him and says, the Lord sees his effort, sees his des desperation, sees how this man wanted to know who Jesus was. Does this sound familiar? It sounds like our life. Where we're caught up in the day-to-day -day activities, we're caught up with work, we're caught up with school. Not only that, but then we have the, the, the society weight of uh, social media, of what's trending. We always want to know what's happening, right? Other people are dictating the trends, but here the majority of us are followers. And that's what makes the difference. Because when you come to Christ, sooner or later, you, you, you realize that God is calling you to be a leader, not to be a follower. God is going to give you the preparation, the capacity, the formation for you to, to become somebody in Christ. So that you can talk to others, so that you can minister to others, so that you can testify to others and say, I was that person, but look at me now. 
My, I come from a family of, of drunks, of addictions, of, uh, of, of all these different things. But then you can say, but I broke away from that through Christ. Look at your family. Think about this for a second. Think about your, think about your closest family. Uncles, aunts. Look at your parents, grandparents. Look at your cousins. You see those flaws that they have? You see those addictions that they have? Maybe some are drunks. Maybe some like to get high. Maybe they, have, uh, they, they, they go and they, they have gambling addictions, whatever the case is. All those things that you see in your family, that's, those are the things that still are in you. If you don't come to Christ, if you don't, the, the Word of God says that in Christ we, we are a new creature. We are reformed. We are, we are uh, begotten from above is what the Word of God says. We are begotten from above when we repent and we come to Christ when we accept our Lord Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives and we get baptized and we start to become disciples. At that point, you are fully renewed. Your mind will be renewed. At that, mind, at that point, whenever, if you had an anxiety for, I don't know, for, for alcohol, for, for drugs, God will free you from those things. God wants to free you but what a privilege it must have been when, when our Lord Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your home, at your house. And then verse 6 says, and he hurried. Can you imagine? It says, he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble. Who saw it? The Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were a sect of religious people that existed over 2,000 years ago. That when our Lord Jesus was here, he was not impressed by them because he says to them, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You guys do good deeds. You guys give money to, to the need, to the needy. You guys give shelter to, to those who need help. They, they, they have a life full of appearance. And he says, you know, if I take this cup, and he gives them an example, it says a cup must be cleaned from the inside out. Because that's, let me tell you something, and that's many of us here. We, hey, just because I'm, I'm up here wearing a nice shirt, holding this mic, doesn't mean that I'm fully cleansed. There are still things in my life that I need to get right. Let me tell you something. There are still things in your life you need to surrender to God. Nonstop. And that should be our, our daily prayer and say, God, reveal to me what areas I need to clean in my life. God, reveal to me what, who, who, what friendship is not edifying me. How many of us know that there are toxic relations, relationships out there? Boy. <laughs> there are some, man, I don't know what's going on, right? Things have changed for sure. But there are some toxic relationships. There are some toxic people. And you know what? These toxic people who feed into toxic relationships, fuel toxic relationships, you know what happens? They have a hardened heart. They have a heart that maybe has never known love and doesn't know how to give love because it's never received it. Maybe all they have have been, they've been deceived. Maybe they've, they've entered into a relationship being hopeful and they were brokenhearted or heartbroken. That causes a, a, a hardened heart. That's hard to say, by the way. Hardened heart. That causes a hardened heart. What is your heart today? How does it feel? If somebody says to you, Jesus loves you, do you like, ugh? What's your reaction? Are you like, ah, oh, come on, man? Or are you like, yeah, yeah, Jesus loves me. If somebody goes up to you, and this was me, if somebody goes up to you and gives you a hug and says, God bless you, are you like, oh, man, right? That was me. I don't like hugs, right? I've, I think I've expressed that a couple of times. I'm just like, ah, uh, you know, I've always, I always had self-esteem issues growing up, right? But I've, I've, I've delivered that, given that to the Lord, right? And so I've been working on these things. See, see there are still things in our lives. It's so, it's so, it's so feasible, right? 
What areas in your life have given you a hardened heart? Think about that. Do you love? Look, look around you. Do you, do you. Could you potentially love any of us? Right? I can say I love you, I love you, I love you, and maybe I don't know you, but the love of God that's in me causes me to love you. Right? The, God, the, the grace that God has given me, it's the grace that I want you to receive as well. But we see here, it says that when they saw this, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Look, your family, I don't know about your friends or your family, but when you start to see God, your family and friends become an obstacle. They will start talking. They're going to be like, look at this guy. He's now a Christian, but he still, he still listens to, I don't know, you know, whatever. A, a popular mainstream. I don't know. I, I'm not going to promote any bands up here, right? That's the first people who are going to talk about you is your family. You know, maybe you've been coming to church and you accidentally slam your finger, right, with a hammer and, you know, Praises and worship are not going to come out of your name, out of, out of your mouth, right? What are you going to say? You're going to say what you really feel, right? It happened to me the other day. And I can tell you I gave a genuine hallelujah, right? It was in Spanish, though. I slammed my finger, and I was like, ah, hallelujah, right? But I was like, oh, I felt good about that because I was like, man, it's, I didn't slam my finger, and the last time I did it, I can remember exactly what I said. But there will be people who are going to be obstacles in your life when you want to seek God. As you get closer, people will talk, to you, talk about you. But then I love, I love what this man does. It says, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And I have, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Here's a man who, who knows to be grateful. And I'm not saying that you have to give your offering, you have to give your tithing, or give something materialistic. But that is an action of gratitude. And that's what the Lord does. When you've genuinely had an experience with the Lord and you know your life is not the same, that's what you do. You do it in, 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 uh, in gratitude. You constantly, you're like, thank you, God. How many of you gave thanks to the Lord when you wake up this morning? How many of you last night before you went to bed said, thank you, Lord, for this day? How many of you, take that back, how many of us prayed before our, our last meal? Say, thank you, God, for this meal. Do we have gratitude towards God? Analyze that. Think about that. What do you drive around with? Do you, do you walk to work? Do you walk to school? I see some nice cars out there. Glory to God, right? Glory to God. I, have you been thankful to God? Saying, hey, thanks, God, because I'm rolling deep in a 2023 something, you know, Tesla. <laughs> gratitude. There's got to be gratitude in your heart, but only you can experience that when you come to Christ because that gratitude is going to be like none other because there is nobody in your life who will do what God does. And that's when you find the, the, the genuine gratitude. But there's more, and it says here, If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And I love this, and this is what the Lord says to you today. It says, And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. Listen to this. Zacchaeus was a descendant of Abraham. That's what he's saying right there. He was a descendant of Abraham. There was a blessing coming down his bloodline. There is a blessing in his inheritance, in his genealogy. There is, an, there is a blessing. And the very same way, it's up to you. It's not up to me. It's not up to the person next to you. It's not up to anybody. It's up to you. But again, if there are sinful conditions in our life, that, that will only be a barrier between you and God. And lastly, go with me to Galatians 5.22. And it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by spirit, by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Go ahead and go back to verse 23 for me. Uh, one more. Go back. Check. Look at this list real quick. Think about that. How many of these things are genuine in your life? How many of these things can you say, hey, I, I've, I've got that characteristic? Because let me tell you something. Whenever you come to Christ... And, and, and the Spirit of God comes into your life and starts to cleanse you and you start to, to be ministered by the Word of God, by what you listen, by what you read, you start to have experiences with our Lord, guess what? Your life is not going to be the same. And not only that, but you sooner or later will give these fruits. Sooner than later, you will start to develop these traits, these characteristics in your life. Amen. But let's think about this really quick. How's your love for others? Think about that. I was, I was sharing that, this to the other day to somebody. And I said, you know, I, I've been married at this point, I think 13 or 14 years old, 13 or 14 years of marriage. And I think about love, right? And love, it, it evolves over time, right? Love goes from, from being an emotion or a feeling, it goes and it evolves into a decision to where you, you, you decide to see the good things in that person and you look past their flaws. That's what love is. That's the genuine love. When you look at your friends, when you look at your neighbor, when you look at, at, at your family, do you see their flaws or do you really see them with love? Think about that. Because that's a very powerful trait that God gives us here. Joy. Look around. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I worked in customer service for a long time. And somebody told me one day, they were like, yo, man, like every time I come, you know, and I scan my card, uh, I kind of get intimidated by, you know, when, you, when you're looking my direction. And I said, why? They're like, I don't know. You just look like you're, you're grumpy all the time. And that hurt, right? Because I was like, I'm not grumpy. I felt like, you know, I should be, <laughs> you know, like. And so uh, I fell into the habit of smiling all the time and to like, you know, just like, hey, you know, being all that fake, exciting kind of guy. And it, it, that could only get so long, you know, far uh, along. But how's your joy? You know, how are you a bitter person? When you wake up, are you already mad? Right? I have a seven-year-old, and when I wake him up every day at 645, this guy is mad. You know, he just wakes up and is like, again? Like, literally, we're going to do this every day? How do you wake up? Are you joyful? Peace. Are you, are you a calm, peaceful person? Do you know that the Lord has control over your life? Or are you somebody who is always anxious, nervous, because you want to have control over things? Patience. How's your patience? Are you tolerant? Kindness. How kind are you? How generous are you? Goodness, right? How good are you? Right? It's, and, and the other day I was talking to somebody about this. It's not always about doing the right thing. How many of us know that? It's always about doing the right thing for the right reasons. There's a difference between the, doing the right thing because I have to be seen like the Pharisees, right? They would go and they would do these things because they were being seen. But they weren't doing it for the right reasons. I, I, I have two kids, and whenever they get in a fight, I'm like, say sorry. And they'll be like, sorry. And they walk around. They turn around. How many of you have done that? I don't know. I've done it, right? Think about that. You say sorry, but do you genuinely mean sorry, or are you just saying sorry because now you're committed to say sorry? It's not enough to do the good things only. You have to do the good things for the, for the, do the right thing for the right reasons. Faithfulness. How faithful are you? And I'm not talking necessarily in a, in a relationship, but I'm talking to your friendships, to your job, to your service to God. How faithful are you? Go, go to verse 23. 
Gentleness. How gentle are you? How kind-hearted are you? And this is what I was saying earlier. So many of us have a hardened heart, right? You ever meet somebody and, and, and right off the go you get a, a really tough vibe from people? That's, that's what their hardened heart might be reflecting. Self-control. Do you have self-control? I forgot who I was talking about this, but they were like, they were like, man, you know what? Uh, I, it was something about watch, seeing their phone while they were in the restroom, and I was like, man, you know, we should start timing these things because, like, you know, when you go to the restroom, you're literally there for, like, 45 minutes, but you're on your phone. Like, I don't, you know, TMI, okay, maybe, but think about that. How much time do you spend on your phone, on social media, on all these things, right? And then it says, against such things there is no law. God has a calling. God wants to call you by name the very same way he called Zacchaeus. And he said, hey, it says today, it says today salvation has come to this house because you too are a son. You too are a daughter. And God wants to do special things in your life. And God wants you to be freed and wants, wants you to be delivered from any, any addiction, any, any, you know, any chain that you might have in your family or in your life. But look around you. Times are getting tough. Things out there are not, you know, getting any easier. And if you don't have a defined character, if you don't have a defined personality, if you don't have a defined conviction of who you are, let me tell you something, any, any kind of, any trend is going to come by and it's just going to sweep you off your feet and you're going to fall in exactly into what all those people are doing. And that's exactly what happened in the times of, uh, of Noah, where it says that the sinful condition of man had reached the sky limits. And that's why God said, and God regretted having created man. Can you imagine that? That's how sinful this world was, that God regretted creating man. And what did he do? He pressed the reset button, right? But it says that he found a righteous man, and that righteous man walked with, Jesus, with, walked with God, and that was Noah. So whenever there's, tribulance, uh, whenever there's tribulation, whenever there's adversity, God is going to seek his people. God is going to seek those righteous. God is going to seek those people who have the fruits of the Spirit, and he's going to say, hey, these are the people that I need. For the, for the times to come. And I make you an invitation. If you've never done so, start seeking a relationship with God. Start saying, God, I, I don't know much about you. And I know it can be intimidating to say, God, you know, say, hey, God's characteristics, God, uh, God's character can be found in the word of God. That's true. But you know what? Talk to God. Pray to God. Seek God. And you will see how he will start to to give you experiences as you're driving. He might just, you know, uh, give you an experience right there. He might just break you down right there. As you listen to, to your music, think about it and say, is this music really edifying me? Whenever you're listening to the radio, think about that. No, put some worship music. Say, thank you, God. Thank you, because you're allowing me, you allowed me to wake up. You're allowing me to go to work. We have to have a heart of gratitude. Amen? Amen. And if you want to just stand to your feet or bow your head, we would just say thank you, God. Thank you, because for such a long time, God, we were lost. And, and you, you give us an example here through, through your word, through your scripture, how how a man, small of stature, who was being rejected by his own, rejected by those also who he worked for. He hurried up. He climbed obstacles. He was able to go around this crowd, Father, these obstacles, and he was able to seek you. And he was able to, 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 to finally get to see who you were, maybe afar. But at a distance, Father, you recognized them and you called them by name and you said, hey, come here. I'm going to dine with you tonight. And there is no bigger reward. There is no bigger reward than letting our Lord Jesus Christ come into our hearts and 
dine with us. He wants to get to know you. He wants to get to know me. He wants to, to hear your voice say, thank you, God. He wants to hear you say, God, you know, I've been going through these things, and God is going to be right there. God is going to be right there just listening to you. And we thank you, God, because you've been so great. You've been merciful. You've been kind-hearted. You've been so graceful, God. We thank you, Father, because you take so much. You take so good care of us. You provide for us. You shelter us. And we thank you, God, because your word has been clear, God. There is a no other way through salvation. There is no other way to live a good life except going through you, Father. And we praise your name and we thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our life. Thank you for what you're doing in this ministry. We praise you in Jesus' name. We praise. Amen.